Welcome to another video for Flatten the Curve Summit. We're trying to make sure we have some conversations with diverse voices ahead of the conference. Um, and we have the opportunity today, which is amazing, um, to talk to uh, Lior Tressman, um, who's at uh, Make Haven, which is a makerspace here locally in New Haven. Um, so Lior, welcome. Thank you, thanks for having me. So uh, if you could just give the listeners, the audience, um, a little bit of an understanding what your role is at Make Haven, what Make Haven does, and then maybe go into some of the stuff you've been doing for uh, the pandemic. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm the shop manager at Make Haven. There are three staff. Um, and in normal times, about 400 members. We're a community nonprofit makerspace, about 8,000 square feet, metal shop, wood shop, lasers, 3D printers, screen printing, beer brewing, and industrial kitchens, sewing, quilting, embroidery, stained glass stuff. I'm just looking around trying to think of all the things. Uh, there's leather working and vinyl printers and casting and plastic bending, you name it. Uh, we also have about 25 facilitators. So those are instructors who are here to teach people how to do whatever it is that they want to do. They uh, teach you how to use things safely and how to protect the tools and yourselves and how to how to um, learn how to do whatever you're trying to do. So we there's no expectation of expertise when someone comes in. A lot of people show up with no knowledge of how to do anything, but just the excitement to learn how to make things. It's fifty dollars a month and we're open twenty four seven. So people come daytime, nighttime. There are ten offices in the back here where people work out of here is their full time job. There are a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of hobbyists, tinkers, artists. There are companies and labs that'll come and use Make Haven as their, as, as their shop instead of having their own. And uh, we, we do cater primarily to the hobbyist artist prototyping scale. We do have a lot of space, but we aren't fitted for production. So we're really excited to help burgeoning businesses grow to a larger scale and help point them towards facilities that can handle that kind of quantity. Um, so yeah, it's been really exciting to be a part of this. We moved to this location about, about two years ago. I can just sort of show you a little bit of more interesting background. Maybe I'll just point this way so you can well, awesome. see something more interesting behind me. It's a bit of a mess right now because I'm the only one here. We've been closed for about a month. And in that time, uh, I've been mostly the only one here, um, which is, unfortunate because it's normally a really exciting, fun place to be with a lot of people. But what we've been able to, to do is get involved in a bunch of the COVID related projects. So uh, in the beginning, I think a lot of people were really, a lot of the, sort of the, the makery people were really excited by the prospect of a ventilator because that from a making perspective is a really challenging, exciting prospect. Uh, from our perspective, that was, that that's not an easy thing to make the threshold for how um for how good it needs to be is really really high you just it can't mess up even once it needs to run a million cycles at least per patient and just it can't it can't even mess up once and that's a that's a pretty high bar so we started we let other people work on the design of that and for the first week or two we focused on masks so we now have more than 100 people around new haven using our videos and instructions and designs uh, to make face masks. We uh, then help distribute them to organizations around the city. We provide people with the elastic and the, the nose bridges to help facilitate that. They can, ha we have non-contact pick up and drop off points for those materials and masks. Then we worked on face shields. So we've made about 2000 face shields for Yale New Haven Hospital for various organizations. We've worked in collaboration with the Neuroscience Corps and Architecture School over at Yale because they have these huge lasers. So they can cut out the plastic fronts really quickly. And then we assemble them here and distribute them. We worked on some projects with some physicians around Yale on intubation shields. So we were able to prototype really quickly because we're a few blocks away. So they, uh, we would, make an intubation box, which is effectively just a, a shield that goes around a patient who's being intubated, have an endotracheal tube put down their throat, which is a very aerosol generating procedure. And, um, and so that's just to protect the provider. 
And so we were able to mock it up, bring it over to the hospital, test it out, make, and then bring it back, make some changes. And then we, over a few days, came up with a final design, which we made a bunch of, School of Architecture made a bunch of, and then we drew up specs, brought it to a local manufacturer, and now they're making them for sale, which is ideal. So our role in that was the really rapid prototyping that a company isn't quite nimble enough to do it, a bigger company. And then, but we don't have the scale to provide these long-term large needs. So we were able to take those designs and pass them along, which was pretty exciting. I can show you some of the remnants over here of those boxes. They're clear, so they're a little hard to see in the camera. Uh, but there's a bunch of them laying around. They're different designs and, and whatnot. There's a project working on nasopharyngeal swabs. So the swabs that they put way back in people's noses to test for COVID, they've just found that the bug happens to live up in your nasopharynx. So we use those swabs to test for it. They need to not be PCR inhibitors because that's how they test for the, for the virus. Um, you can't have like bits of, you know, of like a synthetic cotton falling off in the back of people's heads. There are a bunch of design constraints. So we were working with some labs at Yale on how to fabricate those based on designs from around the country that other people had come up with. Unfortunately, most of the manufacturers of those are in Italy, so we are in dire need of them currently. Um, we were looking at SLA printing at FDM using MarkForge, which we happen to have. So there are a bunch of different designs that we were running with in parallel to test. Um, so that was an exciting project. What else? UV sterilization for a little bit. Um, I'm sure there are four others I'm forgetting about. The, and then eventually, once things started to feel a little bit under control in terms of those, we handed off most of those projects to, it's now when people come to us for face shields, for whatever, we can send them to other manufacturers, um, both large and smaller scale. The, then we decided to come up with a team that was gonna work on a ventilator. So there's a Facebook group turned whatever that had a whole I think it's like 80,000 members some ridiculous number of people now that's focused on COVID open source medical supplies so they did a really good job of curating information that's been vetted by engineers and, and doctors to uh, help makers know what are good things to make so they looked at about a hundred different uh, ventilator designs and they so they didn't even they don't even really want people making ventilators because that is a dangerous proposition. They have a lot of other things that, that people can make that are really valuable. And that's where we started. Um, but they did do a comparison of ventilators that other groups had made from MIT to India, all over the world. And number one, based on all of the qualities that they were looking for, durability, buildability, uh, how much it had been testing, how suited it was for COVID based on a number of factors, bunch of other things. Number one was the design from Medtronic because obviously that's been tested more than any other. It's a design that's actually used. Where it scored very poorly was on buildability because the designs that Medtronic put out would be very difficult for someone who didn't have a whole R&D team to, to, to actually work with. Uh, so number two on the list was Ambovent out of Israel and their design is very buildable has been tested, they're working on approvals, and it hits all the checkboxes of what a COVID patient needs from a ventilator, or at least what 80% of them need. So we aren't trying to build a ventilator to replace ventilators at large that can help in all cases. Uh, they're really fairly complicated machines that, that try to do a lot of different things, but we just need a ventilator for COVID. So that means it doesn't need to have all the bells and whistles. Right. It just needs specific ones. So that made it easier to design and make. And we've been really lucky to have a really good contact with the Israeli team. So we were, we're meeting with them pretty regularly to help make sure we can help their design. They can help us move along more quickly. And as of last night, we had our prototype chugging along pretty pretty darn close to being ready. And we've been making ours in concert with local manufacturers so that we have their input in terms of what would, how we can build ours so it will be as manufacturable as possible. So for example, like 3D printing is not a great solution at scale. It's great for prototyping, but it is, is not very scalable. So uh, we've tried to make parts that we can cast, for example, or parts that 
we can turn on a lathe and you know machine mill whatnot um, so that's been really helpful and then hopefully by tomorrow or the next day we'll have worked out all the kinks we can just take our set of designs and drawings and hand them off we'll probably make a bunch here just um just cause and to keep working through the kinks but i think it's uh this is something that we want being done by a, a company at scale so um, I know early on in the crisis, um, there was a lot of talk about 3D printing um, parts or nozzles for, for ventilators and so on. And I know those only fit, I think, Italian ventilators or something in the beginning. Um, I know a lot of that knowledge has sort of been open sourced now and people are sharing and obviously that, that Facebook group is huge, 80,000 people. Um, so it's really encouraging for me to see definitely. And I think a, lo a lot of people are encouraged about that kind of collaboration that's been going on. Um, how do you see that developing? Um, have there been bottlenecks to that or are things just running pretty smoothly? What's your opinion on all that? In terms of the flow of information or 3D printing as a tool? Let's do both. <laughs> So I think a lot of people's instinct when this, it became clear that we weren't well equipped to deal with a, a pandemic as, as a country or perhaps as a world. I mean, certainly as a country, we've outsourced a lot of our manufacturing and other countries need to take care of themselves. So they aren't sending us all the PPE that they could normally. Uh, so we found ourselves in a bit of a pickle um, to say nothing of our government's ability or lack thereof to respond to a crisis. And the, I think a lot of people's instinct was like, oh, 3D printing, like people have been talking about this forever. You can just print whatever you want. Like this is, this is it, guys, go, go, go. Like a bunch of nerds with the 3D printers, like this is your moment. And it's like, well, eh, eh. 3D printing is okay. It's really slow. Uh, it is it generally, like if someone has a 3D printer in their, whatever room, it probably prints in PLA, which is pretty porous, has a low melting point, so it's hard to clean. Um, and it's pretty rough. Like if you have a something 3D printed on your face, it's, you're gonna be bleeding by the end of the day. So it's, it's not like a nice smooth surface. So it, I was pretty skeptical of the value of 3D printing in this crisis initially. Uh, and I think a lot of the designs and whatnot that I saw initially, and obviously like reporters don't, you know, necessarily have a great grasp on this so when they hear a story of someone printing things like oh that's awesome without sort of the context um and i think there have been some cases where 3d printers have been super valuable i know for us working on this ventilator they it's the only way i mean we could reasonably do it this quickly when we need to make a an adapter for an oxygen hose going on a pressure sensor we in the course of a few hours can iterate through four different designs until we come up with the right one. And that would just be so hard otherwise. So that is incredible uh, in terms of that prototyping iteration stage. In terms of scale production, the fact that there are 3D printer or people have 3D printers all around is nice right now. You don't really want to get a bunch of people together. So being able to distribute their production is nice when you can find something that is good for them to print. Um, the trick is then collecting things and distributing and also making sure that to your point of the of this flow of information, making sure that what people are printing are, is actually valuable. Uh, I think that it's, it can be hard. I, I at one point saw a hair band uh, or a, a band that takes the distress of the mask elastics off your ears or the back of your head on an N95. And I printed a bunch and just did not have much success. And then with some of the physicians at the hospital, they handed them out and the feedback they got was it worked for some people, especially women with a bun of hair and it could sit above the bun, it worked great. But for a lot of other people, it wasn't so great. So we tried a bunch of different designs. I have a tube sitting here over here. It was just something I grabbed off the table. This was one, it was obviously together. Uh, here's another. So um, I think if we do come up with a really good design for these, then this would be something that'd be great to 3D print. We could distribute the model really quickly. People could crank them out. Um, and it's small enough that you could create a bunch in a reasonable amount of time. Sure. Yeah. Face shields, uh, like I haven't really seen a face shield design that's 3D printed that I thought was great. Like the way that we make them is just a piece of plastic, a piece of adhesive foam, and an elastic around the back of your head. And that is very fast to make. Sure. So not as fast as like one, a disposable one with just like one sheet of plastic that's all cut on the laser. 
but so much faster than 3D printing. And also most of the 3D printed ones leave a gap uh, up top, which isn't great because then part droplets can come down. So I think that this has been a really cool test. It'd be really, um, it'd be great if, I mean, I think there's about as much coordination as we could have expected. There have been groups that put together designs and iterated sort of in a very organic way to come up with the best designs. People have worked with their local healthcare providers to find needs that are helpful locally. Um, and, and I think people who um, are sort of on, on the fringe of that, who are like reading this in the news, get, you know, will with time sort of hear the full picture. Yeah. I mean, that doesn't really matter so much, I guess. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely, it's been inspiring. It's also, if you check out these Facebook groups, a lot of them are, I mean, it's just like every comment has 200 comments and it's just yeah. where you even begin. So it's a uh, inundating. Yeah. It's yeah. right. It's completely inundating. So to have someone be like, here's the document we've curated the information. That's a huge help. Um, and I, I think like the reality is right now, time is so tight, supply chains are, are so strained that you don't need to make the best thing. You just need to make something that can work with what you have. Finding elastic now is practically impossible. Find, if you go to McMaster car and you want plastic, like McMaster car is just, it's like, that's it. That's you, you, they just, you, they have everything under the sun and it comes the next day. And uh, that is being tested right now. And for some things, that's very much not the case. So some, you have to get really creative with where you source things. So you can't necessarily, like once someone puts out a design, all the supplies in that design evaporate within hours. So having like a one size fits all just isn't really gonna work when, when the supply chain isn't built to, to feed that. Um, so I think having a diversity of ideas helps, you know, helps it all work. We, I mean, we've had to get really creative with where we get plastic. Sure. So, so I, th I think one of the interesting things to me, um, and you know, we've seen an uptick at Make Haven definitely with membership and people being active and so on mm -hmm. um, throughout the years, the new space a couple years ago and so on. Um, but what's interesting to me is, you know, I haven't heard or seen this much attention towards maker spaces in a long time. <laughs> so yeah. it's it's kind of nice at least i mean and i don't know we're we're sort of in the sure. middle of it so i'm trying to put myself on the outside and just look in yeah. um it, it just it seems to me that now that that maker spaces are a big part of the conversation not only um as spaces for people to sort of tinker and prototype their own stuff but as sort of this social benefit to you know like new haven right, right. Um, not having a maker space in new haven would have adversely affected to put it mildly um, sure. So I'm wondering where that's going to go. I'm hoping, you know, there'll be grants and so on that sort of get freed up after this. Um, but what's your perspective on that? And I guess, you know, um, as far as Make Haven goes, and I know this will be decided throughout the, <laughs> throughout the years and as a group, but do you think this is something where um, a rapid response plan will be, you know, it's something we can plan for for the next crisis? Or? Yeah, I mean, I think... Like, obviously, right now, it'd be really nice to have more manufacturing in the United States. And right now, we could pay for it. Right now, we'd be willing to pay for most anything. Um, but in normal times, we aren't willing to pay the price of American manufacturing. So we outsource it. And I think this is not the same uh, at all. But having the capabilities of makerspaces throughout the communities in the United States, at least, and perhaps abroad, uh, offers some sort of small scale manufacturing that can be called on really rapidly to respond in an emergency. Uh, whereas a company like a, fa a factory, even if it does exist here, is going to take a few weeks to tool up at least. I mean, it's just they will create, they'll really crank them out once they do, but they're not very nimble because tooling up a factory is expensive and difficult and time consuming. Uh, so I think having makerspaces be a a resource to a community um, that can act like small scale manufacturing when it's needed, when it can be paid for, like where that, where that higher price can be paid for in a time of crisis that isn't affordable normally. I think that's an interesting idea. Incorporating, for, for that to be a, a more structured response plan for, for people to 
think like, all right, in the next you know, event that this happens, we're gonna call on these people to make the face shields because we're not gonna be able to get them from here. I mean, that's not a very stable proposition. Um, I, I, like I certainly wouldn't want anyone to rely on that. I think we could just be a little more proactive and stock up on masks and shields and stick them in a closet somewhere for the next time this happens. But there will be unforeseen problems. And I think knowing at least the people in your community who can make things quickly and who can help organize other people making things is a valuable asset for a city or community to, to bear in mind. Um, I think something that's been interesting right now is a lot of people are sitting at home more. They, they're social distancing and what, however that looks like based on their, their work and lifestyle and whatnot. Um, and I, at least from my perspective, it, not looking on it, Instagram and other people's sort of hearing about their lives. Like a lot of people are gardening and working on household projects and working on things that they wouldn't get around to normally, that they would hire someone else to do, that they would, you know, just just procrastinate or not not do at all. And so I think that maybe a thin silver lining is people are sort of appreciating the value of making something with your hands, of taking the time to put energy into something that you wouldn't otherwise. I mean, time is really tight normally. And right now time is a little less tight for some people. So um, I've had a bunch of, actually, there was a reporter the other day who, who said he was gonna sign up. He came, he was like, oh, it's incredible. I'm definitely like, I gotta sign up with this, this is all over. And my, my wife is gonna love it. And, um, and I just thought that was a hoot because in my mind, I'm like, I'm just tunnel vision right now. And so for this guy to be like, yeah, totally. Like, this is a great thing. And because from his perspective, he's sitting at home twiddling his fingers most of the time because there's nothing to report on or very little relatively for, for what he's normally doing. And so the idea of making things is super exciting. And he was telling me about all the projects he's working on. So I think there is perhaps a, a little bit of, you know, maybe people after this would be like, oh, I was enjoying that making thing and I can continue that at a, at a maker space. And they'll hear about it. They'll, more people might know it exists from, from the publicity. I do tend to think that while what we're doing is, is valuable and worth people hearing about, there's also just not much going on. <laughs> so I think, I mean, you just kind of- Besides, besides the crisis, right? Right, besides uh, the crisis, like everything's shut down. So you can really only like, when you hear like, oh, makerspace making stuff, that's like, that's a good story. Um, and I'm not complaining about it. But, sure. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Well, it's one of the reasons I'm talking to you, but I mean, um, you know, <laughs> same thing here. I mean, uh, obviously, you know, I'm at home now and I've been in the space a lot recently, but uh, for a long period of time, I just wasn't even able to make things for myself or do a lot of the projects I, I sure. wanted to do. So it's been really nice and refreshing. Um, I'm kind of hoping that that attitude, which I think came out mm. of the recession um, last time around, where people did start getting more into crafty things and, you know, DIY stuff. I'm hoping um, we see that. So, you know, maybe that's a silver lining. I think, I think you might be right about all that, so. Um, okay, well, I think that's a good place. Uh, a nice positive message <laughs> at okay. the end of all this. Uh, and I know a lot of people are dealing with a lot of stuff. So it's really nice to see Make Haven stepping up, um, helping out and getting that PPE to the people who really need it. And we're, we're, only, able um, so thank yeah, you, we're, we're only able to do this because we have members who are still paying membership dues in spite of the fact that yeah. they're very much not able to come in. So, I mean, this is really right. only possible because of the members. Uh, otherwise we'd be, I would be without a job. We would be very much closed up. So it's, I'm, I'm able to do this because I have a boss who is willing to continue to pay me to work on non make even related things. He's only able to do it because they're members who care enough about make even to keep paying, even though they're not able to use the space. So it really is, it's, this is, there are a lot of people whose goodwill is to thank for this, this, these projects. Awesome, awesome. And thank you for putting that in focus too, because that's huge. Um, and that's really a way I think, you know, obviously I'm biased because I love Make Haven, but uh, I really like seeing the organization not only stepping up, but seeing how much people have sort of um, decided that, hey, you know, I can't get into this space, but uh, you know, I'm gonna keep supporting it and so on. So that's huge. Um, so thank you very much, man. Uh, thank you for giving your, me your time on the weekend here. Um, we're going to be doing Flatten the Curve Summit um, on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday of next week. Um, so, you know, I'm going to invite 
Make Haven members and everyone else. Um, that is going to be in support of public health and digital rights initiatives. Uh, we're going to be donating now 100% of the proceeds beyond our small costs for it um, to uh, GNU Health, which is a healthcare uh, tech initiative, and Fight for the Future, uh, which works on net neutrality and a bunch of uh, net neutrality and a bunch of other things, um, but also has a big campaign to help flatten the curve uh, through staying at home. So uh, we'll all stay at home and then hopefully you and I can hang out and make Haven soonish. So <laughs> we'll see how things go. Well, Thanks so much, Lior. And uh, anything you want to plug before uh, we sor sort of uh, go on to other things here? Yeah, I mean, I think so we've tried, and by we, I mean Kate and JR, the two other people who work at Make Haven have done a really good job of curating a lot of projects on our website. So if anyone's interested in making stuff at home for this, you can go to makehaven.org and we have probably eight different projects that you can get involved in in one way or another, uh, from home, from not from home, from money, you know, whatever. So I think, I think that's it. There are a bunch of interesting things to check out if you're interested in getting involved. Awesome. Thank you so much, man. Thank you.